Good morning. Can you hear me okay? So I'm Dr. Joelle Vlahakis, and I actually think I have the best job in the hospital. So, um, I know it's a little unusual. We're all here to talk about what we do so right here at SMH with cardiac care, and we do. And that's one of the reasons that my job is so great, actually. Because as we advance, and as we have so many more options to offer, and as we successfully age in this community, right? Because that's what we all want. Things get more and more complicated. Medical decisions become more thorny, and we're not always sure what we're gonna get. So, so much of what I do is about sitting down talking to patients and learning about who they are, which is really pretty phenomenal. And another reason I get up in the morning is because I happen to know, although this is not always the most, uh, uh, I don't get a lot of wear on with this uh, in cocktail parties. Um, you know, none of us gets out of here alive. We all get a turn. And it's really, really important to me that when it's our turn, it goes really, really well. Because we all deserve that too. So. I do have something to disclose. I happen to write for the hospice medical director certification exam. Straight up, nothing I tell you today will help you with this. So. <laughs> okay, so why am I here? Um, for the most part, we're all very glad that we have hospice care in our community and we're all under the belief that we'll never have to use it, right? Um, so we don't learn very much about it. And even my fellow colleagues often aren't sure what the difference is between hospice and palliative medicine. And I'm totally okay with that. When I first started in hospice care, I'd been doing it a couple years and they said, hey doc, would you, would you substitute and do our palliative care service at Sarasota Memorial Hospital? And I said I'd do it, but I'd do it for three weeks because I didn't know anything about it, and that was 10 years ago. So I want to talk a little bit about hospice and palliative care in terms of its historical context. It's a medical specialty. How did it grow up? Why is it here? What do we know about it? I want to make sure everyone understands hospice as a system of payment. And if you understand that, where the money goes, then you understand how hospice and palliative care can work together. And then I want to make sure everyone understands that hospice and palliative medicine do coexist and do function similarly in their approach to care. But it's a bit of a puzzle, isn't it? And the challenges of cardiac disease often fall very, very smack in the center of the things that I aspire to be good at. Things like prognosis, things like symptom management, things like assisting in complex medical decisions and helping define what our real goals are. And those we all deserve, regardless of where we are on the timeline, right? Okay, so I think it's good to understand that hospice began as a social movement. It began as death with dignity, and it began across the pond, as they say, in the United Kingdom, but came to us as a part of the Medicare benefit when it was signed into law in 1982. Tidewell, just for uh, historic history's sake, has been here since 1980, and it was formed as a part, initially, of a few nurses at SMH who knew we could do a better job. Medicare is an entitlement program, and I'll go back to why this is important a little bit later, but if you deserve it, you should have it. So in order to obtain hospice, two physicians have to certify that if the disease follows its normal natural course, it is likely that he or she will succumb within 80 days. That is not possible to know for certain, but Medicare gives us a bit of forgiveness as physicians. So the first physician is assumed to be the referring physician, isn't it? And the second one is probably the unsung hero in our community, the hospice medical director, who's behind closed doors, looks at that case and says, yes, indeed, I can justify that this patient should access their hospice Medicare benefit at this time. And they write up a little narrative that goes up to Medicare. Okay. So understanding that the Medicare hospice benefit, which is what it's officially called as a system of payment, it comes out of part A, the same place that the hospitals come, come from. It's supposed to be budget neutral, meaning you get all these wonderful services, and I'll talk about those later. But in exchange, we ask that you not necessarily pursue acute care. And most people at that stage don't want to, so it's a nice exchange. 
I don't want hospital care anymore, but I want care at home. I don't want extraordinary treatments, but I want good medical management at home and people to visit me. It's an interdisciplinary team. It functions a little differently than the hospital environment. The big hero of the day is usually the RN case manager. That person interacts with the patient, the family, and also manages and negotiates with the treating physicians. The hospice medical director is important, but a much smaller role than, say, physicians in the hospital setting. There's social work, chaplaincy, and I put those together not because I think they're the same, but because CMS looks at them the same. And by that, I mean the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. They give bereavement services for 13 months after a loss. It's all part of the services they render, and the reason that hospices can function the way they do is because, for example, in our community, volunteers outnumber the number of employed hospice people, colleagues, three to one. They're the reason that hospice works the way it does. And once someone accesses this hospice Medicare benefit, then all the things that are related to either treating the terminal condition or keeping the patient comfortable are covered. Hospital beds, oxygen, medications, any services related to that terminality of that patient are covered. It is the best kept secret in insurance, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so not physician visits. Physician visits are separate, and that's relevant. They all come under Part B, which is the same as if I'm rounding in the hospital or seeing you in the office. Okay, so evolution of a specialty. So they invited doctors in. They did so reluctantly and only because it's part of that hospice Medicare benefit. In order to get paid, you needed a doctor to show up and shut up and sign. That's what they needed us for. But you know, once we got introduced to this approach to care, we started thinking about other ways in which this might work well. This interdisciplinary approach, which is patient-centered, no, it's family-centered care. Really, really good symptom management. Real care and excellence applied to this, not just a simple afterthought, but the essential ingredient to managing a patient and family. And giving good prognosis, allowing people to plan. And difficult conversations. And what that does, the benefits of planning for the end. And making sure it looks like that patient wants it to look like, and family needs it to look like. So it begged the question for us, how come only our hospice patients get this kind of care? How come everybody doesn't get it? What would happen if we turned things around and every patient received this kind of care? Interdisciplinary, family-centered, with good symptom management, an accurate prognosis, with providers who can frame difficult conversations so that we can plan for the end. What would happen? And what would happen is palliative care. So, all palliative care is, I know it's associated with end-of-life care, and I'm okay with that, but it's so much more. It's specialized medical care for people with serious illness. And ladies and gentlemen, all of our patients in this hospital have serious illness, don't they? It's focused on providing patients with relief from symptoms, pain, stress, whatever the diagnosis. The goal is quality of life for both the patient and the family, because illness is a family experience, isn't it? So palliative care here is supportive care. That's what we call it here. It's a nice name to call it. Everybody understands what that means. Oh, great. An extra layer of support for people with serious illness. Right now, it's comprised of myself and my hardworking nurse practitioners. I see a couple in the audience. One is working upstairs and it's provided alongside curative treatment, no matter what age or stage. So as doctors started to assume some of this knowledge and evidence, the evidence began to grow, and it became a medical specialty recognized by the American Board of Medical Specialties in 2006 and CMS in 2008, and I was able to sit and take boards in 2008. So, all hospice care is palliative care, but not all palliative care is hospice. And now you know more than probably 90% of the staff upstairs. All right, so the two, the two specialties 
absolutely use similar skills, but they should and do function very differently. So what's more with feeling? Hospice services come from the Medicare hospice benefit, meaning you have to sign something in order to access it. For palliative care, services are independent of the payer. We bill insurance like everybody else, and you don't have to sign anything, which means consultants, we, that's all we are. And my fellow physicians don't have to ask permission if it's okay if palliative care comes and sees you. I hear that a lot. You don't have to ask. I will explain what we do. It's an interdisciplinary team. For hospice, you must hold, at least we think, a prognosis of six months or less. Palliative care, you can get at any age, in any stage, alongside curative treatment. Hospice has comprehensive services that follow the patient throughout the illness. And no matter how much I love my patients, I don't follow them home. OK. One other historical thing to know about the Medicare hospice benefit is that it's based on the cancer trajectory, which is smooth downward usually for patients who ultimately succumb from cancer care. So many of us don't anymore. Both of my parents are cancer survivors. So typically, it's predictable. It's steady decline leading to death. And it is for us, for hospice medical directors and palliative care physicians, probably the easiest of the trajectories to manage and expect. So when we first signed hospice into law in 1982, cancer diagnoses took up about 2 thirds of what we did. But now, more than 2 thirds of hospice patients have non-cancer diagnoses. So it's a little tricky. And that's where the piece of the puzzles come together for cardiac care. Because what happens when you have something that doesn't look like cancer care, when you have a chronic, unrelenting illnesses, which is punctuated by areas at times when you might be uh, more ill, but then recover. And usually, right, death often occurs as a result of one of those acute episodes, but we don't always know which one. And so how can we identify with any certainty which of those patients with heart disease might benefit from hospice care or palliative medicine? So yeah, this is what it looks like for most of our folks. Non-cancer illnesses, heart, lung, et cetera. So heart failure, just as an example. So I'm an internist and a pediatrician by training. I stumbled into hospice and palliative medicine quite by accident, but I always enjoyed managing my heart failure patients as uh, an internist. And that has served me very well because so much of what I see is heart disease now. And it's really important for me to keep those skills up because it's really hard to predict. There are certain signs that might portend a poor prognosis, but in general, it can be hard. A lot of people have these symptoms in a, during their acute phase. Their symptoms are present at rest, if they do any physical activity at all, symptoms are increased. And it's always amazing to me how people kind of adapt to this. And it happens slowly over time, so almost no one notices. In general, if people have a low blood pressure on, with heart disease, and specifically heart failure, that can be a, a bad sign. And it can be a bad sign if you have a resting heart rate greater than 100. And then anemia can also help me know that maybe we're, we're getting towards that six to 12 months. There are other things for specific systolic heart failure. You guys live and die by the ejection fraction. Sometimes that can be helpful. If the heart failure is due to ischemic heart disease, myocardial infarctions, heart attacks. If people have low sodium and we can't get it back up again, that can tip us off. Sometimes kidney function, that elevated BUN and creatinine, can help us understand that things aren't going well. That's an end organ that often tells us things aren't going well first because it uses so much of our heart output, our cardiac output. If someone's cachectic, meaning thin, that their energy expenditures just getting around are so high that they can't even manage to keep up their nutritional needs, if they just can't do as much anymore, we say reduce performance status because that makes us you know, feel all fancy, but just that you can't do so much anymore. And confusion. 
So I've seen a lot of people get labeled with dementia when they don't really have dementia. They've just not perfusing their brains very well. And our brains are really sensitive to that oxygen level. And think about it. It's an end organ too, so if our cardiac output's not that great, that's one of the ways in which we might demonstrate it. So in general, when I'm approaching a patient in the bed, the first thing that I might look at is their visit history. How many times have they been to the hospital? And that, my friends, is the strongest predictor in heart failure patients as to how they will do. Not the only predictor, but the strongest predictor. All right. So let's say I'm looking at a patient and I think they might, might need hospice care. What are some of these hospice criteria? And I think you'll be surprised at, at, at how intense they are. So some of us use the New York Heart classification. Four is the worst, symptoms at rest, not feeling well, episodes of confusion, episodes of um, uh, times when they're not perfusing their end organs very well. And hospice asks, did you try everything? Are they optimized on medical treatment? Have we taken it as far as we can go? Maybe we're limited now because if we keep giving them meds, their blood pressure will go even down, down further, that kind of thing. So they like it if your ejection fraction is less than 20%, but remember, that's only for systolic heart failure, and as we age, diastolic becomes more uh, interesting and more prevalent, and so the ejection fraction's not always helpful. So I don't want ever anybody to feel like, because somebody comes in and says, you have the ejection fraction of an 18-year-old, that that's necessarily a good thing. So if people are syncopal, meaning that they're losing consciousness, periodically. Sometimes I'll get patients from the trauma service, for example, because they've fallen, and this is very helpful to know in the background. If their, um, part of their cardiac history involves the presence of what we used to call arrhythmias, but more properly dysrhythmias, um, then we know maybe we have something here. And it's always amazing to me how many of my patients have a history of cardiac arrest, meaning their hearts have stopped already. If there's any relationship with that um, cardiogenic brain embolism and what they presented with before, stroke and the like, and then um, HIV because the HIV drugs can precipitate cardiovascular disease and the like. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give you the definitive evidence that your doctors really love you. Here's the thing. Most of us, get it right about 20% of the time when we talk about prognosis, how long someone has to live. And often, survival was overestimated by a factor as much as five. And guess what? The longer we've known somebody and the more invested we are as physicians in that patient, the higher the overestimation is. Because we dig you and we want you to do well. Generally speaking, when a physician any physician gives a prognosis, you can usually divide it by three for the real one. Unless people are very, very close, then you get more accurate. So knowing this, could there be a role for hospice or even palliative supportive care? And I think there is, in part because hospice is an entitlement program, meaning that after working hard, their whole lives and qualifying for Medicare. Medicare wants us to figure out a way for people to get this kind of care, this interdisciplinary approach to care, which is so much more family-centered and less costly, frankly. They want us to figure out reasons to get people in to hospice care because at this point, most of our hospice patients in this community, although we're granted 180 days of that hospice Medicare benefit, right now, on average, our patients are staying in hospice care 10 and a half days before they succumb. Okay. So, one of the things that I, again, aspire to be good at is advanced care planning. So we know, for example, in patients with heart disease, specifically congestive heart failure, 
that they are six to nine times higher than the general population to uh, experience a sudden cardiac death. It would sure be nice to know what they want us to do when and if that happens. Nowadays, there are also advanced care planning codes. So for my physicians in the audience, other providers in the audience, when we have these talks with patients, we can actually ask Medicare for, for a little bit of payment for that discussion. They tend to be a little longer. In fact, Medicare gives us two codes in case we have to go, go long on some of these discussions. I think what's really great about our cardiac patients is generally they have a wonderful relationship with their cardiologists. They've known them a long time. They depend on them a long time. So when there's an opportunity to talk about what would you want if, there's lots of punctuation marks along the way, like if and when someone needs an, an implantation of an automatic uh, defibrillator device, when there's a hospitalization. Because that trust relationship, I don't have to do procedures on patients anymore. My procedure is the family meeting, but my cardiac colleagues have actually been there and seen something that even their family members haven't seen. Their cardiac vessels, their hearts, there's no stronger intimacy than that. I can't compete with that. And then there's opportunities to talk about complex medical decisions, things ahead of time. It's amazing how productive you can have a, as a conversation when you're not in crisis mode, right? Talking about things like, if you needed it, would you want dialysis? Would you want it as a temporary measure? Could you see yourself having it in an ongoing way? Would you ever consider prolonged mechanical ventilation or being on breathing machines? Would you want it or would you be willing to put up with it for a short period of time? What are you going to do when things get worse? Can you imagine a time when you might be sicker? And what do you want that to look like? And then goals for care. What's really important to you? It's amazing to me how many people tell me, you know what, if it's the end, one, I want to know, and two, I don't want to be in the hospital anymore. And yet, we accomplish that goal, at least here, so infrequently as to be heartbreaking. All right. so. Again, one of the things I continue to strive to be good at is trying to take care of symptoms and cardiac disease. And the wonderful thing, I think, one of the reasons I'm so in love with managing my heart failure and ischemic heart patients at end of life or before end of life is because it allows me to continue to use my internist skills because good symptom management is good medical management, ladies and gentlemen. It's not like necessarily what we used to think about in cancer treatments, for example. Chemotherapy, it's so horrible, it's not anymore, but it once was, you have to give that up in order to feel better. In heart disease, it's quite the opposite. We need close collaboration with your cardiologists and other providers in order to figure this out. The other thing that's really interesting is oftentimes when patients are referred either to palliative care or hospice, because that clue, because that good symptom management is good medical management, and because suddenly there's an interdisciplinary team working, good care, lots of conversations, goal setting, and relief of anxiety by goal setting, we can not only improve the quality of life, but sometimes and oftentimes people actually live longer with this approach to care, which is extraordinary. So there are two studies that suggest that. I won't bore you with the details, but one we affectionately call the TEMO study, and that was a study which just demonstrated that patients with lung cancer at the time of diagnosis, if they were just given a handful of visits with a palliative care provider and everything else stayed the same, they lived on average two and a half months longer. And with a life expectancy of 14 months, two and a half months is a long time and that was with no other changes. If we had a chemotherapy agent that did that great or some radiation treatment that did that great, it would be malpractice not to use it. And yet, so often, palliative care is not asked to see these patients. And the 29-day study was very interesting. They had patients come on service of hospice care, 
and they managed them in their usual way. And then they compared them to patients who were getting the usual care in and out of hospitals and the like. And on average, the patients who had hospice care actually lived 29 days longer. And that's the same as the NHPCO study, now done eight, 11 years ago. Okay, so since good symptom management is good medical management, I wanted to say something a, a little bit about opioids. Um, I know, I know that so much of my profession is assumed to have its bedrock on morphine. And I know that culturally that's kind of a bad word. When we're using morphine, that must mean we're at the end. And that's not necessarily true. And I do know more than, than one trick. Um, but I just wanted to say that opioids can and do have their role in managing heart disease. Um, they are really wonderful at managing anxiety at times. They can be wonderful at managing restlessness. And we think they can also be helpful with preload reduction and afterload reduction, maybe. Overall, what we think happens is that cardiac muscle, that heart muscle, uses less oxygen in those, in those times. But I would say that I like to use a skilled hand. It's not for everybody. But in the right hands, it can be wonderful. And we use minimum necessary in order to manage the effect. Sometimes my team and I joke that we run in the room, say opioid or narcotic, and we leave. That's how much they get, really tiny amounts. Always the minimum necessary. The other thing I wanted to point out, and this is a mystery to me, and I'm, I'm, I'm okay not solving it necessarily here, but about a third of the patients that I manage who have heart failure at end of life have generalized pain from a source I don't know. Is it because those tissues aren't being oxygenated well? I don't know. I just know when I hear it that they have pain, even if I'm not sure why, it's very likely that they do, and it needs to be managed. Okay. So the ultimate goal of palliative care is an integrative role. We don't take over. We partner. That's when it's the best. The idea of providing that comfort in a seamless way to patients with late stage disease, that's the goal. And what we depend on our colleagues is to identify those patients who may be in late stage. And if they're not sure, ask us. So one last piece of the puzzle here. And that would be the providers in the audience, the clinicians in the audience. Most of the palliative care in this hospital and in this community is not delivered by my team. It's delivered by my colleagues. And they do an excellent job. And I know that they do. I have lunch with Michael Blanchett sometimes from the heart failure clinic. He's amazing. They know what they're doing. And I know that. I'm here to help, but I don't, I'm not the only one who can do this. And that's it. So I hope I didn't depress you, right? That's uplifting, right? <laughs>